Well, it's about time for us to begin. Thank you for being here tonight and I appreciate the faithfulness uh, that you have on Wednesday nights. I look forward to studying the Bible together. We're going to be in the 17th chapter of Acts in just a moment. And I hope if you have your Bible, you'll want to turn to that and follow along a little bit with the sequence of some things that are going along. I'm enjoying kind of helping you see the beginning stages of the early church and some of the challenges that they had to go through. So uh, keep that in mind as we come to study the Bible in a moment. Let me lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll have our Bible study tonight. Lord, we are very aware that we're here by your grace and your goodness. Thank you for allowing us to live in this day and this time and this place. Thank you for letting us be the Camellia Baptist Fellowship and what you've meant to this church and the joy of our time together. Now, would you bless our Bible study tonight? We want it to be uplifting, encouraging. We want to honor you and bless your name. We want to be strengthened by it. We want to grow in our faith tonight. So teach us from your word those things you want us to hear. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay. I finished last time some verses in chapter 15 and 16. And was at the point that Paul was going to a well-known place that later he wrote a book to and that's to the church at Philippi about the Philippian people and I left him in Philippi now that does and I'm going to kind of skip over that tonight other than just this brief overview not because Philippi was unimportant but you're probably more familiar with that than most any of the churches you remember Paul met Lydia there this uh, this amazing lady who, who was a wealthy business lady and and she became a strong part of the work there. And then he met this person who had a, a handicap and God blessed there. But as a result of that, they got thrown in prison. But as usual, God worked while they're in prison. And then you'll remember the, the events of the Philippian jailer and the wonderful question that is the great evangelical question that, that almost every preacher has preached a great evangelistic message on, what must I do to be saved? And, and, and Paul told them, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And, and God did wonderful things. The Bible says that, that the jailer and, and his household were saved and the gospel spread through them. But in the meantime, of course, they're, you know, they're in prison. And, uh, and instead of it being a great welcoming event, it was like a lot of things that happened to Paul. They were in prison. And then uh, finding out, as Paul said, well, you know, this is not exactly right. And they kind of ushered him out of town. And uh, so he finally left there, having believed that the work would go on, but not believing he should stay there. And he traveled about 100 miles to a place that he also later wrote two books back to, and that's Thessalonica. And, of course, those were the, book, the first and second Thessalonians. And uh, that was an important place of ministry, and it's, it's what's talked about in the first part of chapter 17 that we're going to look at tonight. But things didn't go well there for Paul either. And after a, a, a wonderful beginning, he ended up having to leave there, and he went on from there to a place called Berea. And so I want us to kind of look at, uh, at at the sequence of some things that happened and from Berea things didn't go well and ended up in Athens. So tonight I'm kind of looking at, at, at this as a picture of Paul's ministry and I'm going to bring out some things that are alike for all of these in a moment. Uh, but just want to give you an overview of kind of chapter 16 and 17. But now let me look at 17 with you a little more um, in detail, the first number of verses. Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews and according to Paul's custom, remember I've told you that before, that was his custom, he went to the synagogue for three Sabbaths, that meaning for three weeks in a row on the Sabbath, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ, that means the Messiah. And many of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a great multitude of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. Then verse 5, But the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace 
formed a mob and set the city in an uproar coming upon the house of Jason. Uh, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren from the city authorities shouting, these men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason was welcomed to them and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying that there's another King Jesus. And so they stirred up the crowd. And uh, so finally, they, uh, they received a pledge from Jason. It seems that he decided, okay, I, I want everything to do with it right now. And they released him for a little bit. But Paul and Silas decided to leave there and they went on to Berea, picking up in verse 10. And when they arrived, what did they do? They went to the synagogue of the Jews. Now, again, I want to emphasize that because we often think of Paul as the great missionary to the Gentiles, and he was. But he never forgot his people. And you remember I talked about the importance of some things they needed to do last week with Timothy in order that he might be accepted in the synagogue when Paul went to, uh, to uh, teach there and to preach there. Verse 11, now there were more noble-minded those in Thessalonica. They received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were true. You know, it's always important to examine what you think and what you hear of what the Bible reveals. That's true still today. Many of them were, were believers among the number of prominent Greek women and men. But again, when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea, also they came there, likewise agitating and stirring up the crowds. And immediately the brethren sent Paul out as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come as soon as possible, they departed. So now Paul has gotten to Athens. Just going to pick up with two verses more. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. Now, I'll stop there for a moment. And you'll remember, just to, to forecast a little further, that, that we often talk about Paul's great sermon in Athens on Mars Hill. And it was... Uh, it's recorded later in that in the next chapter. But an incredible sermon from Paul uh, that the world still needs to hear. So I've kind of walked you through from Philippi to Athens. Now, what is it that we need to hear for just a moment? The first thing I want to remind you about is uh, the contrast that often is found between how Paul was living and what happened to the people who were converted they didn't instantly move into comfortable living. And Paul certainly didn't have a comfortable experience. He was shuttled from town to town, in and out of prison, threatenings. The people who were converted uh, had many, many difficulties along the way. It's a serious matter we need to kind of take into account sometimes. Uh, the ease with which we assume Christianity is meant for us versus what happened to him. There was a cartoon that portrayed a billboard a few years ago in front of a church that went like this. Welcome to the light church. 24% fewer commitments, home of only the 7.5% tithe with 15 minute sermons, 45 minute services, and only eight of the 10 commandments required and your choice on those. We just use three spiritual laws in place of five and everything you've ever wanted in a church and less is here. Now, of course, that's poking some fun, but, but there is, uh, there's thinking behind that, that some people want less. They don't want the full deal. They want the security that Christianity brings, but not the commitment and calling that Christ has in the life. But that would not have been Paul. Everywhere he went, he was driven out of the city, as I've said, uh, from from the people who mostly were obviously the Gentiles and pagans in some of the cities, all the way to the intellectuals and the Jews, it really didn't matter. But the, perhaps the, the neat thing I want you to, to notice is that, that Paul, uh, it was said about Paul and those with him, that those who have are stirring up or changing our world or upsetting our world have come here also. 
Uh, I'm not sure that Christians are really upsetting the world today. The world is more upsetting Christians than Christians are upsetting the world. And it's supposed to be the other way around. And it was at one time, but Christians were unwilling to stand on the firing line to take the heat and the world and its sin has taken over. Now, uh, particularly, I want you to notice in all of the, uh, virtually all of these experiences and other places Paul went, there's there's a there's there's a mob violence that happened. There were there were people who came from other towns. Remember in Berea, they came from Thessalonica and they said, "Oh, we've heard he's over here," and they sent a whole mob over and they began to cause uh, all kind of violence and upset in the community. Does that sound like anything that happens today? Mobs and crowds. Remember that, that I mentioned Sunday morning in the message um, that Jesus said he didn't, uh, that it wasn't always going to be peaceful following him, that instead he came to bring a sword. And I said that that didn't mean he came to fight everybody, but it meant that, that he was going to be divisive. You remember in the Gospels he said that there would be fathers and mothers that would be separated and children from parents. And that, that it, compared to the love for him, it would look like they hated those around him. And when that happens, there's going to be opposition. I believe, as I tried to say in the message Sunday morning, the greatest issue going on in America, America right now is this huge spiritual battle between the forces that hate everything that Christianity stands for. And the reason they want to tear so much down about America is because so much of America was built on the Gospels and on the Bible. Now that doesn't mean everyone in places of authority that would claim to be quote a conservative or whatever is a Christian. But the principles that founded our country stand in significant and diametrical opposition to the primary tenets of the progressive movement. And I say these things not to try to choose a political side, but as a and trying to be honest about it, to read the tenets of various groups who lump themselves under the progressive movement is to destroy much of what this country was founded on. But the same thing was going on in New Testament times. Now, in a sense, there's comfort for us in that. If there wasn't a struggle, it would mean that it was already all over. They haven't won, but they're in a dominant position right now, and it's never, ever been more important for Christians to vote, to stand up for that which is right, to pray for our country, to pray for leaders, to support those who will stand for biblical principles. We need to be men and women not committed nearly as much to a political party or a movement but committed to Christ and Christ only and willing to die if necessary, willing to go to prison if necessary. Because Paul wasn't a fool. He was perhaps one of the brightest intellectual men of his day. And he knew that every city he went to, it was going to happen. But he kept going. He kept going. And we must be willing to do whatever. Why? Well, I guess tonight I would simply say it's really important to do it because the world needs to be upset. If, if, if the Bible is not true, if God is not the creator, if human life is not different than the animal world, if there is no afterlife, if Christ or the story of Christ is just a myth, then we need to just back out and shut it down and join the opposition. But if it's true, then God has a responsibility placed on us because he gave us the gospel and he gave us the opportunity to share it in the world and he gives us eternal life. But he says, I want that for the whole world. And the measure of your love for me is going to be shown by how you are committed to the principles that I give you. The world today or much of the education world and the higher education and it's filtered down to not only the graduate level, in many places, not only the college level, but even beyond that, in certain places at the high school level or earlier in the education system, there are people who don't have a respect for the Bible. I think I told you one time, 
and it's been a long time since I was in college, but I had a professor in college. I really liked him. He was a history professor. We got along really well. I think I did all right in his class, but he knew on campus that I was committed to the ministry. And so he would come along to some of the things out of history that aren't the best examples of everything Christians have done. And, uh, and he wasn't a believer. And so right in the middle of class, every once in a while, he'd say, Marshall, stand up. What do you Christians think about this in history? And he was trying to embarrass me and embarrass the other students who claimed to be Christians in class. Now this happened a long time ago here in Alabama. If you don't think it gets multiplied in, in, in uh, exponential kinds of ways now, you and I are not thinking clearly. Well, it doesn't mean that everybody that's in education in, by any means is a non-Christian. There are wonderful educators at the junior high, high school, college, and graduate level. I've met some of them. I've been pastor to some of them. I've talked to them, dialogued them. I've gone sometimes and shared in classes and, and responded in questions about certain biblical issues that teachers have, uh, have brought up. It doesn't mean that everybody that's an intellectual or a philosopher is unchristian by any means. So uh, I don't want to presume that way. It doesn't mean that everybody in Congress or legislatures at the state or national level uh, are unchristian. Some of them uh, have risked everything they have or have given up much more lucrative careers in order to try to serve our country and they're faithful in their churches and in worship. It doesn't mean that everybody in the field of journalism is not a Christian. But there are many people in those places that are. And there are people that have voted to make it legal to do things that are beyond our concept and things I really wouldn't even want to say in mixed company and yet have, have ruled out children being able to pray in school or the kinds of things that we would want there. People who've made it uh, perfectly all right to, to destroy a baby in the womb up to the point of birth, but to release murderers from jail as quickly as possible and others that are violators of the law. Uh, there is today uh, a celebration of what I would call brazen sin and outright rebellion against God. But it goes back to the same things we see in the New Testament. You know, Jesus said there are only two roads. A lot of people want a third road that somehow straddles the other two, but there isn't. There isn't in Jesus' teaching. There isn't in the New Testament of Paul's ministry and the founding of the church. And from that time to now, if you draw that line, there isn't a third road. It's one way or the other. The upset world needs Christ, and he uses people that are committed to Christ to do that. Paul remember, he, Paul said he counted everything as loss for the sake of the gospel. That's what he wrote uh, back later to the Philippian congregation, chapter 3, verse 8. As I begin to look at these events, um, I'm reminded that, that somehow or another today, we kind of think that, that, that there ought to be two kinds of Christians or two tracks within Christendom. And, and, uh, one of them is for the gung-ho type. It's for the warriors. It's for the great evangelists. Those are going to go out in the world and make a difference and maybe have all kinds of opportunities. And then there's a comfortable Christian track for those that just want to be good church members. They don't want any, to, anything to rock the boat. And uh, they're quite comfortable in a church that doesn't ever try to invade Satan's territory. And you know, that's just not the way it is. We're not all called to do the same things. Obviously, we're not all called to be preachers. We're not all called to be teachers or staff members. We're not all called to be deacons. But we are all called to be followers of Christ. And it doesn't take a lot of people to do a lot of good. If you were to get a view, now that I've been talking about this for months in, in the book of Acts, and and I want you to continue to think about Acts. There are four people uh, after, after Pentecost and after uh, Simon Peter. 
But once the conversion of Paul, it really begins the age of the church that we think of it when all these visits that I'm mentioning happen. But I want you to think about it. Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy, and let me add Barnabas to it. Five men are who primarily started all the churches of the New Testament other than the church in Jerusalem. Amazing. Look at what those five people did. That is still a part of the whole reason we are in this church tonight. So the world needs world changers. Now, I know world changers was, uh, and I was involved in that for a number of years and had youth groups every year. Man, we had the best time in world changers about 25 years ago. And for a few years, it was a big deal, partly because a lot of legal issues and difficulties that came about taking high school students away and became a, a much more treacherous difficulty and, and certain reasons. Uh, but World Changers was an incredible event. I, don't, I didn't mean that the only people World Changers were high school students, but I knew some events that happened that, that, were, uh, that were not wise and created some problems. But, but World Changers is not just an organization. That's what every church, every member of every church is supposed to be. I want to remind you that, that individuals can make a lot of difference. Think about the inventors like the Wright brothers, Thomas Edison, uh, William Morton, the father of anesthesia, Alexander Graham Bell, the telephone, the Kepler and Copernicus and Galileo, and the medical pioneers like Louis Pasteur who developed vac vaccines. And all down the line, incredible what they did. By the way, among uh, uh, researchers that have listed the top 100 people that have changed the world, uh, besides Jesus Christ being a part of that, Paul is listed at, as number six in a book that was published a few years ago as the top 100 people to alter world history. But, but the necessity of being a world changer is because... The world is, is filled with people who are evil, including some that are speaking from the grave. Now, that might sound a little strange for a moment, but let me tell you, Charles Darwin's been dead a long time, but he's still speaking from the grave through evolution. And I thought about Sigmund Freud and a whole lot of stuff in, in the whole messed up world of, of psychology and psychiatry that got far off track because of some things that he did. And even more so in that which I mentioned Sunday, perhaps the person in our day speaking loudest from his grave causing problems in this country and in many places of the world and the greatest threat to the freedom we enjoy is Karl Marx. He's been dead, but he's still speaking. Well, these were individuals that changed the world. I pray God to raise up another Paul in our day, to raise up a Silas and a Timothy and and these that were faithful in the world because there are other forces at work. They're the forces if they're not by evil people like some of us I mentioned. They're insidious forces that infect us like the drug culture. Like it or not, the movement to, to put things that alter the minds of young people is from Satan. And we ought to be careful and never apologize for talking to young people about the dangers of alcohol, the dangers of drugs, the dangers of marijuana, and a whole lot of things like that. The danger of things that can happen on the internet, the danger of cocaine, the danger of heroin, and these things have skyrocketed as legalization has uh, allowed them to move forward. Satan is still trying to change the world, and we need people who take a stand for it. Because it's an upset world, the upset world needs people to share the gospel because God will change the world only through gospel-oriented and centered people. But it is by its very nature divisive, as I said. So, what is the content of the gospel? It is first of all and foremost and always centered on the person and work of Christ. Um, we need to be very careful to focus on, on Christ 
more than denomination, name of church, organizational style, and a whole lot of things that we do. That does not mean I'm not proud to be a Southern Baptist. I am. I'm so glad my parents were. And if God was going to use me in ministry, I would love nothing more than being a Southern Baptist minister. Given the background of education and the work I've done with all kind of people, all the way from from a president of a Jewish synagogue the next door on one side, a, a leading Catholic in the city on the other side of me, and uh, four other denominations around me the years I lived in Huntsville. Believe me, I understand something about uh, ecumenical issues and a whole lot of things, and I'm a cooperative spirit and been a part of all kind of ministry groups in cities for Christ. But I won't tell you, after the more I know, the more I'm glad that I'm a part of a denomination that lifts up the Bible and centered on that and preaches the gospel of Christ. However, I do think our denomination has almost missed a mark for a number of years that we've never gotten back to. Now, I appreciate the, the call in the latter uh, 25 years of the last century about the Bible and Southern Baptist and the Bible, and I I had my part in all that. But let me tell you, we don't worship the Bible. We worship Jesus, the Lord of the Bible. And the gospel is what we preach, not just the truth of the Bible. It is all true cover to cover and the index pages too. But I want to tell you, it's Jesus that must be preached to the world unapologetically. The work of Christ, the sole basis of the gospel is that Jesus saw a sinful world. He came and died on the cross for us at the sending of his father. And that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God that is proclaimed, the word of Christ. And he comes to speak to people's hearts by the Holy Spirit. And the gospel will either draw people closer or will send them away. It will make them better or it will make them bitter. But we ought to unapologetically preach the gospel because it's the only hope for a world. It's the only way a sinner's heart can be softened in order that he might receive Christ. And that is our message. And, and I'm saying that to remind you, if you saw the three of, three of the places that I mentioned, because I didn't go into more detail about Athens, but uh, as we talked about Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, every one of the instances it says that Paul went to the synagogue and he reasoned with them about Christ. He preached Christ. And it said not only in the synagogues, but in the streets, in the marketplace. Everywhere he went, he took Jesus to the people. And so the gospel is a confrontation of our sin and rebellion against Christ. And no matter what the cost, we must be willing to share it. We verify it by knowing our Bible. We verify it by showing how the Bible is fulfilled in Christ. But we need to preach Christ. It says that the Bereans were more noble-minded even than the Thessalonica, uh, Thessal people of those in Thessalonica. But it says that they were eager to examine the scriptures and through them they found Christ. Faith is what happens when the Bible reveals the truth of Christ and the person of Christ. And so we believe the gospel not just when we join a church, not by affirming the truth of the Bible, but when we believe and trust in Jesus because he's the one who can justify our sins and set us right before God. And we must submit then to the truth of the gospel by sharing the Lord wherever we go, no matter the cost. Um, they need to find in us that everything is not going to be simple or easy if they do. I guess sometimes, unintentionally, we give the impression that uh, if you just go to church and do right, everything is going to go well. Uh, there's a fine line, I, and I don't know what that line is for each person about each circumstance. But what I have known about strong, great Christians who may look like everything is good, they have wonderful families, they are happy, they love their church, they may be serving in a variety of ways in church, but after hundreds and hundreds of people being their pastor for 50 years, by and large, I've looked in those families because as a pastor you get to know them pretty well, and there's hurt and pain, 
And much of the time that hurt and pain is because they somewhere had to make a decision that cut deep and some people didn't like it. For some people it meant they lost a job. For some people it even meant they lost a spouse or their children turned against them or their neighbor made fun of them or whatever. It's not ever going to be a picnic to follow Christ, but the blessings of follow Christ are huge, and they're mostly internal, not external. That's why we have to be very careful in the church that we do not celebrate overly the worldly accomplishments that look like, quote, success. Not because we ought not to congratulate people when they get a degree or at a wedding. I'm not talking about that. But to automatically elevate somebody to positional leadership just because they happen to be able to grow a business or they were given by God the, you know, the gift of being able to talk well and influence people in conversation or they have an influential position in some kind of uh, field in their work that that must automatically make them a great leader for the church is a false thinking. It doesn't mean that God may not use through that, but we need to look at the content of that heart and their commitment to Christ that is borne out by faithfulness, not only in attendance, not only in giving, but in the spirit of what Christ is doing in the church. And that you see and learn over time and with commitment with people. Well, World changers is kind of a theme that I'm talking about tonight. I want to tell you an interesting story that I read a few years ago. I love the story of this man. It reminds me of, of something really important. His name was Rodolfo Loyola. He was born in, and I can't pronounce the name of the town in Cuba, about 100 years ago. He came to Christ when he was 24 year old, years old by an evangelist who had come and shared the gospel in Cuba. Uh, later, he was a professor of literature at a Cuban university, but also was a local pastor in the 1960s. He was 40 something years old by then. The Cuban government in the 1960s instructed him to either abandon his faith or quit teaching school. And to quit teaching school meant that his family was probably not going to survive financially because he wasn't really being paid anything or very little, not even enough to buy groceries as he was trying to pastor a church that the government was trying to squash. They gave him 15 days to decide if he was going to quit being a pastor, uh, abandon his faith, or else quit teaching school. He replied, I don't need 15 days. I don't need 15 minutes. I won't be back to teach tomorrow. Several days later in the middle of the night, he was abducted and imprisoned in a Cuban concentration camp for more than two years. In the prison camp, Loyola won the inmates around him to Christ. Winning that many people to Christ caused such a stir in the concentration camp they transferred him 13 times in two years. And everywhere he went, he won everybody that, that he could have contact with to Christ. In 1970, Castro's government told him he had 30 days to find $2,000 to take his family out of Cuba or he would spend the rest of his life in jail. He and his wife prayed for guidance, writing to family and friends in other countries. 30 days later, he had accumulated $2,010. So with $10 in his pocket, Loyola and his family were sent to Spain, 2000 left in Cuba, where he became a missionary to Spain, and he went around telling everybody in Spain that he was sent by Castro as a minister, a missionary to Spain. And God blessed him there. He died a few years ago, but he had an amazing ministry of winning people to Christ there. Planting churches, leading people to Christ, is not always going to be immediately successful. A lot of work looks like it goes down the drain. And God sometimes does amazing things by people who are imprisoned, by people around them who, who don't believe that the vision is real. Church planters today have difficult times. 
one of my favorite young people in the early years, first half of my ministry at Eastern Hills in the years of Montgomery. There was a fine young lady raised in an incredible Christian home, given uh, one of the best talents in singing that I've ever known of. And God used her in a lot of ways. She would go around and sing in revivals and other kinds of things. And God led her to a fine Christian young man who was um, primarily gifted in the field uh, and trained in, in, in the field of using videos and electronics and that. And they got married and helped get them married a number of years ago. And not long after that, and he wasn't from the church where I was pastor, but a sister church, but you know, they came to me and said, we feel God is calling us to a mission field, but not out of this country. I said, oh, and they said, you know, we feel called to go to the Northeast. And within a year, they ended up settled in Northern New Jersey, just across the river from New York City in an apartment. They've been there about five or six years now. They just recently had their second child. Now their children won't, won't live in a community like Prattville, maybe not good school system. They won't have the advantages of a yard and house like some of us have. And, ease of visiting grandparents, both sets of grandparents are in Montgomery, and they're in an apartment in New Jersey helping a church get going. Now God is using them tremendously. They have had, this couple have won incredible numbers of people, hard New Jersey people, many with no Christian background, many from other kinds of denominations, but he really given up on church a long time ago. So call them to go there but it's not easy. They won't have the same life that many of us have. Now that's what God called them to do. He doesn't call everybody to do it. But I simply want to say, we need to pay attention to what God is doing and be open and encourage others who are willing to strike out as this young couple, as that man named Loyola, as Paul and Silas and Timothy did as they went out in spite of the challenges that they faced, we need to come and approach the world in an uncompromising way, not to cause riots on our part, but to understand that opposition will be against the church, and against the individual who really stands for Christ. Never are we called to invite it, but we're not called to give in to it. That's the nature of fallen Christ. That's what it means to be a world changer. Paul was a world changer, and he calls on us today, the Holy Spirit does, to change our world. So I hope you'll think about these things tonight and, and, and prayerfully seek how God is going to do that. And my prayer is that as God leads a pastor to this church, that he will have an infusion of the Holy Spirit to lead this church to change the world beginning in whatever ways he can right here in Prattville, but uh, to be infused with that power and that wisdom, but uh, lack of fear in standing for the gospel. That's really, really important. So with that, I'm going to transition to the prayer time tonight, and we'll share a few thoughts there. If you have received this perhaps in an email, you've already seen it. If not, uh, let me remind you of some concerns. Uh, we had a wonderful day on Sunday together, and uh, God is working in ways in our church, and we're excited about a, a prospective pastor coming. Does anybody have a shout of praise, just a word you want to lift up tonight, something important to share with us? Oh, yes. Got a new grandma. Hey, man. Got a new grandma. All right. She's doing great. Yes, we, we, we shared that last week, and we're so excited for you all as, as God has, has brought her into your family, and we're, we're praising God for that. All right. Um, let me move to some prayer concerns. Um, pray for the, uh, the, the Montgomery Police Department. I, I've been pastor to a number of policemen. And for a few years, I did some volunteer chaplains who worked behind the scenes for the Montgomery Police Department early in a few years ago, about 15 years ago, for four or five years under one of the 
chiefs that was there. And uh, some of my best friends are in law enforcement. Pray for them, uh, especially in the death of this young lady, um, female detective in a domestic situation. I don't know, didn't know her, I don't know the details, but pray for them, pray for our police department, pray for our police, not only in Montgomery, but in Prattville, in our state, and in our nation. Uh, they're a part of this stand against, that evil is standing against right, not because they're always right, they're human like us, but uh, our, our nation is standing against um, against uh, many people in our nation, against police forces, and we need to stand for them. Sandy Paramore had particularly shared a request about that, uh, certainly for our pastor search committee, the prospective pastor and his family, final issues in the next uh, several days until he comes. Uh, pray for Pam Ackerman in medical test on the 14th, Chris Donaldson at, at Baptist South, Vera Donaldson's son, and Ken Ray, retina surgery, coming on Friday of this week. Uh, some longer term needs, uh, Tim. And, yes. Yes, please do. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. I had not learned about that, but uh, we will for Chris and for Cindy. Many of our folks know them and been in her place often. And uh, we pray for her and for that business and for our city. Um, Tim and Pam Ackerman's daughter, Michelle, remember her in prayer. Uh, their cousin, also Pam's cousin, Warren Cook. For Hilda, our organist, continue to pray for her. Uh, Chris Gray, requested by the Ackermans, for Gail Hester, uh, and I don't have more details than that. I know some of the things that she's been through. We continue to pray for her. L, um, Ed L. Antugia, Jenna, help me there, and also give us an update on him. That's, that's Jenna's, Jenna's dad, uh, Antigua is the way they say it. Antigua. They, um, he was... Uh, Temperature uh, free uh, Saturday, but sure. he went through all that. It had been 48 hours Saturday, so I think he's cleared the uh, the hurdle on the COVID-19. So he's doing much better. And also, my nephew uh, John Edwards Bonner is doing better too. Amen. Good. Shots for praise there. For Jenna's dad, we're glad he's better, and and also in a nephew. Uh, Tina Lett, Mary Warren's daughter. I saw Mary Sunday, didn't get to talk to her about uh, Tina. Uh, Jeanette Lambert, son-in-law, Richie Ray. And uh, then, as mentioned, John Edward Valder, uh, better. And Randy Walters, Yancey and Mary and Lynn requested that, pray for him. Extended term, uh, long term uh, for Ken Hinton uh, for a few weeks now. Uh, to the Baxters, Taylor and Rachel, due September 25th, the Greenleys grandson. Um, Taylor and Bree Gray, due the 18th this month, just a few days away, Tim and Pam Ackerman's great-grandchild to be born. I've mentioned our nation and our world affected by the virus. Uh, boy, there's all kind of conflicting information and, and uh, we pray for wisdom about the school systems. We pray for our churches with programs like ours in our weekday education ministry uh, that the Lord will uh, protect and help the children and the workers and the issues that go on with so many people in and out there. For our doctors, our nurses, our hospital personnel, uh, for our missionaries and their family, our militaries and their families. And again, as I mentioned, especially a prospective parent, uh, pastor. You know, I've been in that position. I know the feelings of anticipation. And uh, so I know how to pray uniquely for him, but you will know how to pray. The Holy Spirit will lead you to know how to pray. And uh, so I'm lifting that up uh, for a weekend away. 
and uh, coming on a weekend from now, this next weekend. So um, we thank you for attendance, for faithfulness. Sunday, I was expecting us to be down a little bit in Sunday because of the holiday. Guess what? Man, we were right there. We had about 136 or 7 Sunday morning. We've been in the 130s for the month of June, and we continued that right into holiday weekend. And I just, I just praise the Lord when I got the word about the exact numbers. I thought we were going to be down a little bit. Thank you for faithfulness. Uh, and uh, just continue to pray for what God's going to do. And we pray that, that our community and our church family will not have an uprise of the COVID virus. We've done well so far. Let's just pray that we all cooperate and do our part in distancing and, and all the things that we need to do that are protective for us. In just a minute, we're going to have a prayer, but uh, I need to get a get a, an update just a minute from our student minister. Do we have any word about, uh, Sunday I mentioned about uh, that we had some of uh, the Boston butts that we had extra that need to be cooked. If, if people, have you gotten phone calls? Do you need still more to sell? What's the word? Uh, yes, sir. So again, thank you to everyone who ordered us. Uh, we still have, I think, roughly 30, 32 butts left. Uh, we have sold about 40 since Sunday morning, which is amazing. Uh, we still have a few left. If you know anybody that would like some, please call me, text me, you know, whatever you need to do to get in touch with me. Uh, we do appreciate everything you guys do for us. We really do. That's all passion. Thank you. Well, I wanted to be sure we kind of heard a word about it tonight. You may need to call your neighbor and say, hey, you know, it's not a bad price, and go for a good cause to help our student ministry, and uh, and let's get word out on that. Yes. Thank you. I, I was not. I know who he is, I, and I did not know that. So thank you for updating me on that. Yes. Right. I just got a text message from Anita. Uh, she's asked to pray for her grandson Evan. Uh, he had a bicycle accident this morning today, and he has to go to um, a, a UAB for surgery first thing in the morning. So, Anita Greenlee's grandson Anita Greenlee, had a, a bicycle accident this morning and is going to have to have surgery at UAB. Yes. All right. Any other requests before we have our prayer? I have a praise and a prayer request. My brother had an accident yesterday due to heat and um, <clears throat> fell on his head, really. And um, <clears throat> it's got a lot of stitches and his face is messed up. <clears throat> but it could have been so much worse. So we're thankful for that. And um, just pray for him as he, is, as he <clears throat> heals and stitches and kind of hard to talk and do things without with all that in his head. Let's pray for Letitia's brother who had a bad fall yesterday and uh, damage to his face and stitches and so forth. I'm saying that because I wasn't sure back here how well you hear some of the things. Any other requests anyone wants to share or needs to share tonight? Well, we're looking forward to Sunday. We're going to have a great day Sunday. Our pastor search committee is going to be sharing some in the service in anticipation of the prospective pastor the next Sunday. I will share a message, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to a, a wonderful, moving service this Sunday morning. And uh, I hope you'll be here and pray for, for all the things that are going on in our church in the coming days. So let's now share together a prayer as we come to the close of our session tonight. Again, Lord, thank you for letting us have the help and strength and privilege to be here. May we never take it for granted. Thank you for health, that uh, we've been able to exist in this time and, and not become ill with this virus. And we pray we'll be able to stay free of that and continue to be a witness for you. Continue to see this church grow and move forward in its ministry and its vision. We certainly pray for a prospective pastor and a wife and children and family. We pray that your hand will be upon him and upon this church for your will to be done. We, we confess that, Lord, it's not our will that needs to be done, but yours. Would you reveal it to us in very clear ways in coming days? 
We ask tonight for concerns that have been shared both specifically and individually in the last few minutes as well as many on a printed page. And Lord, that we cannot or do not name all of those again. Thank you that you know them and you know them intimately, personally, their every need. And could you be a comfort, a strength, and a help to those who are ill, to those who are seeking direction, to those who are spouses taking care of loved ones that are very ill, to those who have children that are hurt, to those who have brothers or sisters in pain. We pray for them. We ask you to guide and watch over them and help us to know how to be encouragers to them. But most of all, would you be a comforter? Thank you for working through doctors, nurses, and other people in that profession. We pray for some of our homebound, people who have loved this church for a long time, and they're not able to be here all the time, but they love you and they love our church. May they know and sense the presence of your spirit, and may they know that we pray for them, especially tonight, those that are awaiting diagnosis, those that are, that are suffering, because of pain or loss, we pray for them. We pray for our children, we pray for our workers in our weekday ministry, for the children and families, for health and protection, for our other children's ministry, for our student ministry, for the work of our church and its, all of its ministries. We lift them up to you tonight. We ask you to guide us through that. Thank you for our service Sunday. Continue to bless our music as we worship each Sunday. And thank you for those that serve faithfully in that ministry. Now would you prepare our hearts for what you're going to do this coming Lord's Day. And we dedicate that service to you already in our hearts. Thank you for our Bible study tonight. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Good to be together tonight. And may the Lord bless you with health and strength until we're together again on the Lord's Day. Thank you for being here.